the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd and his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, they will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, What can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of those, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, everyone. Children, I'll ask you to gather around your devices. If you can see, if I can see you, I'll find a couple of you. Awesome. All right, I want to show you this kind of, well, it's not a kind of gift. It is a gift. So when I lived in Goshen, I had this good friend of mine named Pastor Jess, and um, it was my birthday, and she gave me this bag, and it had um, scrap paper in it, or like a, 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 a just a journal for, for drawing. And to help draw, pencils and colored markers and all kinds of writing utensils. I mean, it's, it's amazing how many things are actually in here. And I was at home the other day, and cleaning around my office area at home, and I found this. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I haven't, I've received this great, great gift, and I really haven't used it yet. So the other day, I opened it up, got some of the pencils out. I'm going to ask, oh, we're already kind of zoomed in. Pastor Jess is just very creative anyway. So she wrote on here, may these pages foster growth. And I drew a little picture. So I, I'm not an artist, but it's just a, a stick figure on a path, right? Um, but it made me think, I have this great gift, but it's only useful if I use the gift, right? I mean, if people give you stuff like this to get creative and do stuff, if you don't do that, it just kind of stays in the bag. And then the gift is kind of pointless, But if we get it out and use it, we can actually brighten somebody's day. And this is what made me think about it. Because as I've been a pastor, I've kept some of the stuff that people have given me. Special artwork that kids have drawn from me. Just simple things. I have to show you this one because this was kind of inadvertently. But... My first call, someone had the bulletin, and the scripture says, he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, but they scratched out the word news and put dogs, and then drew a dog so it looked like Jesus' hand was petting the dog. It's just fun that brought a smile to my face because someone was actually thinking a little bit outside the box. But all these wonderful gifts that have gotten in the past from artwork, from kids. It's just incredible because 
they used the gift that they had of whatever markers and papers and things that were lying around and then gave them to me. And now you guys, I hear, are actually doing that for some of the members of our church and others around us in the community. And that is wonderful because you're given this gift to brighten up somebody else's day. The grace of God that we give is a gift. And as we share that with others, that's a gift for them as well. So I encourage you to keep on drawing. I'm going to start using this more often too because that gift, as we share it with others, can bring others joy and remind each other about God's grace. So let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the gift of grace. We ask you to help us to share that grace with others by drawing pictures, by saying a kind word, by praying for our friends and our family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me put my stuff away here so maybe it doesn't fall out. All right. Grace, mercy, and peace from our creator and our Lord Jesus Christ to you this wonderful day. So last week we heard about God's promise in ashes and rainbows. God lays down some of God's power and vows to never ever flood the earth again in order to fulfill the promise of loving us and all of creation. The ashes we use on Ash Wednesday remind us that we only have a limited amount of time to be and to act as the children of God. Because God claims us as beloved children, we place these ashes on our forehead and in the same spot as the water is poured and the oil is used to claim us. As we are marked with the cross of Christ forever and sealed by the Holy Spirit, God promises to love us always. Today we hear two familiar stories, one about Abraham and Sarah and the other about Peter and the disciples. Well, it's actually more about Peter than it is the disciples. But what is it that Abraham, Peter, and Sarah have in common? Well, simply put, they have the same reaction when encountering God's abundant grace. When they hear of this abundant grace, they think, no, that can't happen. And say, wait, God, I have a better idea. As we travel this Linton road to the cross on Calvary, remember that God's grace is bigger than we can imagine. So if or when we underestimate God's grace, we're in pretty good company. So God appears to Abram when he's 99 years old and says, I will make my covenant between me and you and you will make and make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. And then God changes Abram's name to Abraham and repeats uh, to solidify what, what's going on, God is establishing this covenant between God and Abraham and the future generations of Abraham's offspring. And it's not only through Abraham, but it's also through Sarai, who God renames Sarah. So God continues, I will bless Sarah. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations, kings of people, shall come from her. Then Abraham falls on his face and laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. God said, no, but your wife Sarah shall bear you a son and you shall name him Isaac. So first let's remember that this covenant from God has been given to Abraham and Sarah. And now their reaction. When God tells Abraham he will have a son with Sarah, he laughs. Sarah laughs a little bit later, and she laughs as well. 
So God tells Abraham that by God's grace, he will have a son with Sarah, and they will both, and they both don't believe it to the point that they actually laugh. Abraham tries to give God a better idea. That's what that line was about Ishmael. Hey, oh, oh that, you're, that Ishmael might live in your sight. That was Abraham's way of saying, God, I have a son already. This would be much easier. Just work through him and let our generations flow through Ishmael. But God said, nope, you're not seeing the big picture. Follow me, you and Sarah. You will have a son named Isaac, which means he laughed. And he will be the one. I will form into great nations. So every time Abraham actually said his son's name, Isaac, it, was, it reminded him not to laugh when God directed him, rather to have faith. God is always with you. Now circle ahead to Peter in our gospel lesson today. First, we need to know where they're at. And we get that from verse 27, just before our reading starts. Jesus went on with the disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked the disciples, who the people say that I am? Now, I want to call your attention to the location. This is the stuff we don't always get into in our regular Bible studies, but honestly, we probably should. It's the stuff that sounds so foreign to us that we might get lost in the weeds. But it's important to know about Caesarea Philippi. That was a place of false worship. This is the kind of information movie producers pick up to sell movies. In the Greco-Roman world, people would travel to uh, Panias, which is now called Banis um, in Caesarea Philippi, to worship dead and rising gods. They were required to go there at least once a year and pray, more like beg these dead and rising gods to come back from the dead and grant them another year of life. So first, the dead and rising God, what in the world is that about? Well, think if you're planting seeds in the ground, you want the gods to bring them back to life and rise again. So it was almost like worshiping for your harvest. By worshiping and begging these dead and rising gods, they were begging to save their own lives so that their crops would be prosperous, the waters, uh, um, the um, rains would come down, and everything would grow into abundance. And therefore, promoting their own lives, they would be saved. But the worship was just downright, oh, let's just call it arousing, because it was just very odd. Involved very intimate situations with other people and even animals, if you get the picture. So this is the crowd that Jesus calls with his disciples and begins to tell them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. But those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Now I'm a little ahead of myself. Let's go back to Peter. Jesus begins to tell his disciples he is the one that will go through great suffering and be rejected and killed and then after three days rise again. In the midst of this village of people who are praying to the false and dead, or the false dead and rising gods, Jesus is claiming to be and is the one and only true God. He is the one who will rise again. This is what God's grace can do. It's only through God's grace and sacrifice that we will be saved. Not begging to other gods, we cannot save ourselves. Only God is the one who can save us. So Peter, hearing about this incredible gift, this incredible gift of God, he doesn't laugh like Abraham and Sarah, but 
he does think he knows better. He's like, wait, God, I've got a better idea here. He takes Jesus aside. Good for, um, for Peter. He's setting up good boundaries. He's taking Jesus privately by himself and says, no, you can't go through all this. This is not how we planned it. This is not the way we planned our Messiah to do things, and therefore you must be wrong. You have to be corrected and definitely stopped. Peter's saying our understanding of what God will do, that's what should happen. And to be truthful, our plan really doesn't necessarily include this grace thing. Rather, our Messiah will come back and put Israel back into power by force if needed. And of course, that's when Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. These are strong words for Jesus to use, especially with Peter. I mean, he did answer correctly who Jesus was. But the Greek word for Satan is also translated as opposer. Jesus is calling Peter his opposer. Get behind me, opposer. You are tempting me to to keep me from God's grace-filled plan of saving humanity. Stop thinking of human things and begin to think of divine things. Abraham, Sarah, and Peter all have the same reaction when they think that they have a better plan than God. God is putting something in motion, and they think they know better and want to change God's mind. Or maybe it's better said, Abraham, Sarah, and Peter all have the same reaction because they only have a human understanding of God's grace, which falls short every time. Ever since the flood, the flood of Noah, God's plan has been abundant grace. God knows we cannot save ourselves, and only God and God's grace is the only thing that can save us. For those who want to save their life through self-interest or making a name for themselves or propping themselves up over our brothers and sisters or begging to false gods of our culture, they lose their life. But those who lose their life and dive into God's grace, realizing all God's children are equal, not holding on to their own limited understanding of God's grace, those are the ones who save it. In our reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, we hear, for this reason, it depends on faith. In order that all, in order that the Promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all. As it is written, I made you the father of many nations. As we travel our Lenten journey, examine when we are quick to laugh at God's gift of grace. As a church or community, where do we underestimate the power of God's love and abundance? Where is it that we find, or where is it that we try to rebuke Jesus and focus on human things instead of divine things? Imagine with me for just a moment a world that thinks God's abundant grace is the way to go instead of human hostility and bias. As we are all patiently waiting for our turn to get the Corona-19 vaccine, wouldn't it be great to have a vaccine that brings grace and love into our world? Yet that vaccine has been brought to us. Through the cross on Calvary and placed in the body and the blood of our Savior and now in the sacraments of our communion and, and holy baptism, we have been inoculated with the grace of God. It is our job as the church to reach out to the community and be the syringe delivering God's grace to the world. As we come together as the body of Christ, we will realize and recognize what we need to do. Pay attention. If the Holy Spirit puts an idea in your head 
and your first reaction is to laugh or snicker, listen closely. Because God is inviting you to do something only God's grace can handle. In our community, in the the greater Lafayette area, there's a discussion, an exploration between the leadership of six churches as well as Purdue Lutheran Ministries about what it might look like for all of us to work together. Now, there are so many moving parts to this, this exploration, in this exploration, it's laughable. How can we possibly ever organize seven ministries It's hard to comprehend. But what might God be inviting us into? Our own church is considering changing the the front of our um, building, the outside of it, to create a new community green space for us and for others to use. And there's probably many reasons why we shouldn't do it. Yet, God is inviting us into the possibility of dreaming about it. Our nation is so divided by race and political parties and gender issues and, man, it's just difficult to be in these conversations. If you hear something from another and your first reaction is to refute or rebuke them, stop, notice, listen. Listen really close. Embody God's abundant grace and find commonality within that individual, you are both claimed and loved by God. Don't get me wrong. With the gift of grace, God also gave us the gift of reason. And I'm not naive enough to think we should do every harebrained idea the pastor or any other member comes up with and just say, well, because of God's grace, we've got to do it. But if we are not willing to enter into those conversations with God, knowing of God's abundant grace, We are limiting ourselves to human things when we should be called to set our mind on divine things. Even though Abraham and Sarah laughed, God worked through them because they listened. Even though Peter rebuked Jesus, he was still the rock on which Christ built God's church. God is always with us in our challenges and in our joys But remember, God was willing to give up some of God's own power to show us how to be a loving community that doesn't often listen. By the grace of God, we are invited to do the same. Praise be to God.